<laughs> we're gonna start. <clears throat> <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, this is the uh, 2015 UNE Constitution Day. My name is Ali Amida, Department of Political Science, and it, this is a, a very special event. Uh, we have organized this uh, every year in this uh, time. And Constitution Day, for some of you who don't know anything about it, it's a very, very interesting uh, event. Uh, we are um, organizing it in compliance with uh, a very interesting act or amendment in 2004 in the United States Senate, specifically um, the fruit of uh, the labor and the lobbying of the, the late Senator Bob Byrd of West Virginia. And he, uh, he is known for a constitutional scholar, but also a strong advocate of um, trying to make awareness of the uh, U.S. Constitution. And in the, in the Senate, he tried to um, mobilize support for such an event. It used to be called uh, Citizens Day in the old days. I did some research, and since 2004, it became really known as Constitution Day. Most schools usually take this as a ritual or something boring or something really need to be done. At UNE, uh, we have tried to make it more interesting, more um, link it to what goes on at the university, but also in the society at large. The purpose, if the purpose is really to raise awareness and also learn about the, UN, uh, in the U.S. Constitution, then this could be done in our own terms and uh, in the form of debates, discussions, and also topics that appeal to our students and our faculty and staff. The, uh, this year's uh, theme is um, very specific, and I have to confess, it came to, uh, to me when I was watching an interview with a um, Republican uh, candidate, um, Mr. Uh, Donald Trump, and he was um, asked about, in the famous quote, probably some of you have seen it, he was asked about immigrants, and he was very blunt, and he said, um, you know, I'm an immigrant from Mexico, he referred to them, and I'm not really exact here, they, uh, they are um, uh, drug, um, they bring drugs, they are um, rapists, and they are also, um, some of them are criminals, and a little bit, some of them may be nice, but overall that's the only case. And it's just, I was driving home, and I said, this is big, this is one of our candidates, and also apparently he's doing well in the polls, and this is worth talking about, how to make sense of this. And I said, of course, this is about free speech, and he was very clever in saying that this is really I'm not politically correct, I'm going to be blunt. And when somebody, of course, brings the question of political correctness, which is historically a category used to silence others and say, you really are stifling free speech. Then I think what we have indirectly or indirectly, some debate in our society about free speech and hate speech. So what then I came and said, this is what's going to uh, be uh, the topic now. And I tried on some colleagues, and I think, I, and, and they, they all said, this is really um, uh, an urgent and timely topic. So to, to organize the, the panel, and the purpose is not really to have a conclusive answer, but to talk, to uh, carry conversation uh, among ourselves, I asked the three colleagues who uh, might give us non-conventional, maybe not a, a legalistic point of view or constitutional point of view of, of what goes on and how to interpret this, but give us maybe multiple perspectives. And I ask um, my colleague, um, Dr. Um, um, you know, um, uh, Heather uh, Sandler to, to, uh, to participate in this panel, and also um, uh, Professor Clay uh, Grabiel and Professor John Carney. They come from very, very different perspectives and many different expertise. Uh, 
Dr. Sadler is uh, Associate Professor of Education. She teaches uh, uh, you know, education in the Department of Education here at UNE. And on a very, very much uh, topics related to inequalities, diversity, um, uh, social studies, but from a critical, larger um, uh, eye on the society and not just the peculiar academic uh, concern. So she brings that question of diversity and inequalities to the classroom, and I thought it would be very, very, very um, a good idea to listen to what she has to say uh, about this. Um, my good old friend, uh, Clay uh, Graybold, is, as you know, some of you, he's, um, uh, he was here when I came to UNE. Uh, he was um, you know, um, uh, a professor in the Department of Social Work, but recently served as a director of the School of Community and Population Health and at the, at the University of New England. I think he's still he's in that uh, capacity. He was an interim um, uh, uh, he served also as associate dean for the, the Westbrook uh, College and interim director of the School of Social Work. Uh, also, some of you don't know uh, much about other background, but it's very, very uh, important to know. Uh, Clay is also a playwright. And um, his uh, play, uh, The Calling, has been very successful and uh, was made a, a video. And, and he's a very, very... Um, um, multifaceted, I would say, um, man of many, many passion and many interests, uh, very much. And uh, I thought maybe he will give us a playwright perspective on this issue. And finally, my colleague, uh, John Carney. John Carney has been, um, he's, um, he's a New Yorker, uh, went to Manhattan College and has a PhD, uh, served in the Navy, by the way. That's important, uh, we, uh, something very important for us to know. And he also has a PhD from the School of Social Work. I mean, um, um, new school. New school. Uh, and that's a very unique school um, in, in the United States. It, was, it, was came, it came from Europe um, and established by critical minded scholars uh, related to the Frank, famous Frankfurt School. And they really created uh, that institute in the United States and, and with a critical methodological way that goes beyond the liberalism and conservatism, the center and the right. So in that sense, um, John brings uh, um, perspective from uh, political science and philosophy together. His training is very different from the rest of the uh, other uh, graduate programs we have in the United States. And he has been teaching um, at, um, you know, uh, these courses for many years. He also has, we have the good luck that to discover that he was here living in Maine for many years. And he has taught for us on political science and um, also the Department of Philosophy at UNE. And he's, I believe, that um, writing a book related to this. But me and him talked about the question of tolerance, how to theorize tolerance to go beyond the hate of speech and uh, uh, the conflict um, that uh, plagued any society, of course, including a complex society like ours. So, therefore, um, we have these um, three perspectives. And I asked them to prepare two questions just two questions to, to uh, manage time well and allow you folks to comment and uh, ask questions and also engage in this conversation because I wanted this to be a panel of conversation rather, as I said at the beginning, uh, a matter of conclusive um, um, uh, answer that because in society this question is not resolved and it's not going to be resolved easily uh, because of, of the nature of these debates. Uh, very much. The questions that I would like uh, our panelists to, you know, um, share with us, um, uh, you know, are the following. The first one, I think, probably I'm going to say very quickly, but the two I think are relevant. How to distinguish between what's really free speech, First Amendment, and what's really hate speech? Where this is not a political correct, I say whatever I want to say, and where this is something really hate speech and really. Not just a matter of expressing and, and living to uh, exercising the right of uh, constitutional right of um, speaking your mind without any um, limitation. How to balance rights with obligation with others? Well, that's not a, just a legal question, a philosophical and historical question. And also, I thought it may be important for our three panelists 
to share with us, is there a way to reach some um, way or some um, uh, compromise for uh, tolerance and also um, for maybe reaching some sort of consensus or some sort of agreement that allows us not to undermine the constitutional right for free speech, but at the same time, uh, they draw the line where something offensive or obscene or maybe harmful or hurtful of, um, of other peoples in reference to gender, race, ethnicity, um, religion, a cultural background, or what have you. How to really have free speech without, um, uh, you know, being drawn to become politically correct? And politically correct could use for good purposes, in my opinion, but also could be used as, as an excuse to say whatever you want and offend others. That's not a, just an American debate, that's a, actually a, 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 an international cross-cultural debate. And, and our societies are changing, therefore I think we need to kind of uh, understand this, this is beyond our confinement in the United States, in America because of the complexity of the society and the changes and the gain that happen in the society. This issue is gonna be redefined in every generation. That's why we have the Supreme Court and that's why we have more lawyers than any other society, and more law schools than any other society. <laughs> so uh, at this point, I'll stop here, and um, uh, let each one of our panelists uh, maybe have between five to seven minutes or so um, to give us some commentary, some way of thinking about this, uh, these issues, and then after that, We'll open the forum for comments and also uh, questions here in, in, in our campus in Biddeford, but also uh, we listen to our colleagues in the Portland campus as well who are probably watching us. And I hope, uh, Kat, there are more people in your end than, than here. Here we have a marvelous um, audience. There is um, a full house. Yes, we do have attendees. So we're good. <laughs> very good, very good, very good. All right, um, on, on this note, I think I'll ask, I'll start with, um, with uh, Heather, uh, give her um, uh, the first uh, uh, starting um, commentary, and then we'll move to play, and after that, John. And you know, you'll have between five to maybe seven minutes. Well, first of all, I'm glad to be here, and um, we certainly appreciate all of you coming. Uh, so you'll need to use the microphone for the other campus. Okay. Yeah. Right. I said I was glad to be here, and I'm really happy that all of you came, and also those of you on the Portland campus. Uh, I think, certainly knowing some of the pedigree of my fellow panelists, I think we'll touch on this in a very broad way, and, and hopefully you will ask us questions and push us further, too. Uh, the part that uh, Ali asked me to particularly focus on was um, the third question, how to reach tolerance and consensus for the future. And I feel I have the privilege to work with <coughs> future teachers and other students from the University of New England. And quite honestly, I'm a fan of all of you because um, every time I meet a student, it seems that you all want to make a difference. And so my courses respond to that. And when, um, for example, when I heard about the tragedy that occurred in the church in South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, my first response to that, well, first of all, I mean, the tragedy, I assume most of us know, but um, nine people were murdered by an individual who was motivated by hate. And my response as an educator to that and as a human being was, and, okay, who heard this person talking about this? Who was aware of these feelings that were about to erupt in this individual? And who did not stand up? Um, so that's kind of where I come from, and I'm, uh, I'm not saying I'm perfect either, but I know that for my own education about these issues, it starts with self-awareness and education. So that's my motivating factor, and also in, in digging into these issues, both for my personal beliefs and also for the scholarship I use at the university. Um, there's a quote from a gentleman named Stephen Wessler, who was the former assistant attorney general um, here in Maine, 
who went on to found the Center for the Prevention of Hate Violence in Portland. And his quote from some of his research was, in every single hate crime investigation I conducted in a school environment, I saw the same pattern of escalation from the routine use of degrading language and slurs to stronger degrading language to threats and to violence. And I think when we are aware that that's what happens and also aware of the importance of intervening, um, then we begin to feel our power in this equation. Um, in, and I'm always looking for good quotes. Another a gentleman who's uh, strong in education, Parker Palmer, said, in every situation, we teach who we are. So whether we stand up or we don't, we're teaching. If we don't stand up, we're saying that's OK with us if we hear a slur or some, some piece of bias or hate comment made. Um, so that, that again, that was my response to what happened in Charleston and many other places. And I feel that personally, I, and then extensively, again, I, I feel grateful to work with all of you, that we have a responsibility. If we hear something, we need to be the one who speaks up. We need to be the one who says no. And us, we can certainly work on equipping each other with those kinds of skills. Uh, and we need to apply a critical lens to media reports of events that separate us into us and them, or, and make the they and them disappear and make, uh, make it all we. It's all about us. Whatever happens to one of us happens to all of us. And I think as we begin to, and my courses, some of them address very immediate kinds of um, applications in classrooms, but my Perspectives on American Education course digs into the historical uh, events that preceded and led to many of the current events and are still affecting what happens in our country today. So, um, let's see. Got some other experts, yeah. You might have to three minutes. <laughs> um, when a negative assumption or assertion is made about those people, we need to make sure we're educated and aware enough to counter that. Um, so the better educated we get, the more we are able to have a, a, a response to that. And I feel that we at our university here, we have lots of options for equipping ourselves with that kind of information. So that's one of I'm, 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 you're already here, so I'm not convincing you to come to the University of England, but I'm encouraging you to um, explore the courses in so many of our departments who can equip you with this information and these skills to go out and make a difference. Um, uh, and, and I said that taking these steps toward self-awareness and evidence-based thinking. So, and my favorite question, and my students can all tell you this, is how do we know this to be true? Whenever we hear something on the media or from someone saying it about the other, that's my favorite question. My students will, will you know, let you know that. And it's my favorite question for myself, too, you know, because I try to be self-critical about what assumptions or what conclusions am I leaping to as an individual. And I don't wear this um, bracelet lightly. It's what do you stand for? It's from the MLK celebration in 2012. This is a reminder for me. You know, because again, this is an ongoing process. You know, we need to live it every day. Um, Kerry Washington, uh, this is a little bit of a side topic, but I mean, it's, she's right on target in my opinion. I'm a fan of Scandal, but I'm a bigger fan of Kerry Washington. A good show. Yeah. Very good show. I'm a bigger fan of Kerry Washington. Uh, she received the Glisten Award um, at the ceremony in the spring. And I just happened to be paging, as we all are, paging through looking for things that connect with classes. And her speech was just amazing. I played it for all my classes. And I tried to extract one of her statements. I mean, she just knocked the ball out of the park. She said, we can't say that we believe, <coughs> excuse me, we can't say that we believe in each other's fundamental humanity and then turn a blind eye to the reality of each other's existence and the truth of each other's hearts. We must be allies. To be represented is to be humanized. And as long as anyone, anywhere, is made to feel less human, our very definition of humanity is at stake, and we are all vulnerable. So I think she again reinforced that we are in this together, and we need all of us. So I don't know who was overhearing what the man who committed the crime and the murders in Charleston, I don't know who overheard that. But someone had to have. And I think it puts us all on notice that we need to be, you know, have our um, attention and antennae up high so that maybe we're the one who steps forward. 
And there are ways to do it. Um, and these are recommendations from the to uh, Teaching Tolerance site, which is uh, manned by the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's amazing. It's infinite. It gives us all tools to work with. But very quickly, um, in the moment, if you hear some hate speech, you can interrupt. Um, every time, in the moment, without exception. You can question. You can say, why do you say that? What do you mean? Tell me more. Um, you can educate. <coughs> hate isn't always behind hateful speech. People are often unaware of the negative power behind certain words or phrases. In the moment, explain why the word or phrase is so offensive to you or someone you know and love. And I do an exercise with my students where we talk about the members of our family and we broaden it out. It's not just our biological family, but it's our friends, it's our neighbors, it's our teammates, our classmates. And together, my students and I think about all the ways that a particular word would hurt, how it would ripple through so many of them. Um, and we can also echo in a group setting if not just one, but more than one people speak up against a comment, then it's a, you know it, it becomes an even stronger response. But again, it, again, as an educator, it's all about education. We shouldn't leap to the conclusion that the other person is bad or hateful. They can be uninformed. You know. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, um, Heather. Now um, I'll turn the floor to uh, uh, Clay. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, I, um, I probably will come at this from a little different perspective, but I'm going to pick up on the theme of what we were just talking about, responsibility, which is critical to me whenever we talk about speech. I wanted to start off with um, Mahatma Gandhi uh, identified what he considered to be seven social sins. And I'll just read these slowly. Just think about these politics without principles, commerce without morality, wealth without work, education without character, science without humanity, pleasure without conscience, and worship without sacrifice. I wanted to add one more to that. I think it's implicit in this list, but I'm going to talk about speech without responsibility. Um, I usually am very extemporaneous when I talk in public, but I'm going to read uh, some today because I, I got on a roll writing this and I thought it will say it better than I can. Okay. Um, over the last 35 years, in my experience, the words freedom and liberty in American society have taken on a rather insular, sacrosanct quality. They're often the focus of politicians' speeches and assertions. They're often used to um, excuse things that are experienced by others as antisocial, threatening, or irresponsible behavior. And this is, goes beyond speech, but imagine you know, a person that shows up at the restaurant where you're eating and he's got an AK-47 strapped over his shoulder. Now, he's got the right to do that, but how do you feel with that guy sitting next to you? Um, Motorcyclists without helmets, they're expressing their freedom, right? But I don't know if you know this, but we all pay ultimately for their medical bills. And it's interesting right now in the state of Maine, 28 people have died in motorcycle accidents this year. Uh, the majority of them not wearing helmets. That's just, that's kind of a sight. But um, failing to carry out one's responsibilities as well. We have an interesting case right now with the, the individual who's refusing to grant marriage licenses. Um, it's a very, very interesting case, you know, is that expressing free speech and you know, freedom of religion? Um, and so these are very, very topical issues. But I think we tend to focus, especially now, on the freedom. I have the right to do this. So I, and I don't care about the consequences. You often see that. Christopher Lash wrote a bestseller uh, some time ago, quite a while ago now, called The Culture of Narcissism. Um, I think it's really hit a pinnacle now. If you turn on the television, right, um, keeping up with the Kardashians, uh, the Real Housewives, you just flip channels, uh, everywhere you turn, there's someone kind of um, bemoaning the fact that they only have seven million when really their neighbors have 10 million, and et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's uh, the narcissism is so extraordinary 
but they're constant reminders of our fascination with the self. We tend to do what we can, to get what we can, to say what we want, with no consideration for what contributes to the greater good. So yes, I can say hateful, stupid things, and the Constitution guarantees that right, but who and what does it serve, ultimately? So that's speaking to the responsibility part, the context, how do we respond, is really the important thing. Um, now, Ali mentioned me as a playwright, and I thought I would talk a bit about the role of art in this, which I think is important. I do believe that the role of art is to illuminate the human condition and experience, to create insight. Um, some other popular examples, Breaking Bad, Homeland, Orange is the New Black, right? If you've seen any of these, they all take us to places that we, hopefully, will never go to in our own lives. But in dramatic form, they illustrate the complexity of human endeavors and intrigue. Things are expressed that we would never want to tolerate in open society, but it's important to hear them, to understand them, to have the opportunity to be exposed to them, because they represent aspects of society that must be recognized and dealt with. So in the service of art, we often say things that might be deeply offensive. The question is what comes after. You know, I've actually been a little concerned to see that there's some comics now that are no longer going to college campuses because they feel they can't um, express themselves. And from my perspective, I'd say bring them on and then have a conversation about it, you know. Um, but so do we discuss, process, and work through our feelings and responses to that hateful speech? You know, I, I believe um, that that's the only way we have the possibility to create insight and create change. Now, one role of the academy of education, or educare is the Latin root, which is to draw out, to tease out into existence. One role is to encourage and support deep introspection, observation, and dialogue to go into the difficult issues, not to avoid them. However, some organizations that you'll, you may participate in at times create cultures in which there is the appearance of open dialogue, while in fact differences of opinion are seen as in, um, or interpreted as obstructionist. You may have worked in a context like that. I have a profound belief and uh, conviction only stre strengthened now by decades of experience, I'm shocked to say, that vigorous debate and dialogue always result in better, more just, and lasting decisions. Consider Abraham Lincoln and his cabinet, a team of rivals, as Doris Kearns Goodwin described it in her book of that name. He appointed all of his, uh, the competitors for the presidential, in the presidential race to be members of his own cabinet. Now that wasn't easy, that's not an easy thing to do, to invite your, uh, your worst critics into the room with you but it ensured a thorough vetting of the issues. Unfortunately, many, if not most leaders, and many we're hearing in the political dialogue right now, really seem to fear the open discussion of differences, seeing it as obstructionist or resistant to change. Uh, I'll just share that in my career, I would say I've probably, I probably, I was thinking about it last night, I probably had five or six really seminal conversations with people uh, in which they were people that I had an investment in, a concern about, and I talked and I provided them what I considered to be very honest but often difficult feedback. In about half of those instances, it strengthened those relationships to the extent that they, I, they will last the rest of my life. And in the other three, they probably ended the, the relationship that day. Um, that's very sad to me, but I'm grateful for, I would not have changed a thing because I believe that ultimately the people I want around me are the ones who want to hear it. So just in conclusion, I'd say context is important. It's the response to speech that matters the most, and we have the responsibility to pick that up. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Clay. Um, <coughs> John will uh, have the, um, his comment about the issues. And okay. Well. Um, um, as with um, um, my colleagues here, I too was deeply affected by the Charlestown massacre. And uh, kind of the day after, I was driving around one of the beaches where I take a walk, and I saw the Confederate flag flying. I mean, this was the day after. And, you know, in my mind, I kind of rounded up the usual suspects. 
sunshine's the best disinfectant. Um, you create more harm with uh, suppression than you do with allowing people to vent. Uh, then I started thinking a little bit more about the question of tolerance uh, in our society. I realized that uh, the problem is actually uh, across the culture, across the society. Um, and it reminded me of a little argument by the uh, founder of the New Left, Herbert Marcuse, uh, repressive tolerance. And Marcuse's argument is that, summarizing briefly, when you allow a repressive argument, reactionary, or reactionary argument, a violent argument or perspective to be on the same plane as well thought out scientific humanist truth. It's not the, not the, the bogus idea that suffers, it's the truth. And I started thinking about this a little bit more. When we have you know, kind of a crank scientist uh, debunking human influence on global warming, or uh, someone on the internet uh, positing that uh, autism is caused by uh, vaccinations, uh, with the consequent results that we now have a resurgence of polio, uh, uh, measles outbreak in California, measles used to be something that was wiped out, all because of what? Uh, the deeply problematic nature of tolerance in our society. We tolerate ideas that are violent, ideas that are reactionary, and ideas that threaten the planet. And it's immoral. So I started <clears throat> thinking a little bit more about this question. And uh, the more I thought about it, I realized that there's a, uh, a social movement component here, which I think my colleague Dr. Ali touched on. And that is the contentious debate over political correctness. If you examine political correctness a little bit more, what you find is that the dominant majority or the dominant elite is in fact trying to reclaim the victims by saying, well, by bringing this up and suppressing my right to engage in reactionary discourse, you are suppressing me. <laughs> That's a pretty neat sleight of hand. Uh, so I think that um, uh, Marcuse's argument in repressive tolerance is that in order to have genuine tolerance, we have to actually be intolerant. Now, uh, the reason why I think this is particularly important for us is that in the cyber age, we can no longer count on the, the clean, neat, John Stuart Mill uh, paradigm of allowing, you know, uh, untrue ideas or ideas we don't agree with uh, that are not backed up. Uh, because look, uh, the economies of social media, the economies of the mass media have changed in the cyber age. It used to be that if you had some vicious or untrue perspective that you wanted to put out there, uh, well that would be vetted by an editorial staff somewhere, the New York Times. Uh, perhaps the news anchors themselves would take on the heavy lifting of editing uh, what is the equivalent of raw FBI footage, and it wouldn't see the light of day. Now, if something is going to run somewhere, anywhere on the internet, there's tremendous pressure, financial pressure, on the networks to run it too, and the newspapers, because they're gonna lose readership or viewership and as we all know, that means a tremendous loss of revenue. So what we have is uh, a kind of lowest common denominator driven by the most extreme elements on the internet. And I, I think it's been disastrous for, uh, for groups that are oppressed. I think it's been disastrous for the planet. And I think we have to really uh, push back very hard against uh, tolerance or equating uh, really untrue violent ideas with ones which are sound, scientific, uh, have a preponderance of uh, humanist values behind them. A good question to ask is the question that political philosopher Michael Foucault asks. Not what is tolerance, but how is tolerance used? What is the effect of tolerance? 
uh, and it serves elites very nicely. Donald Trump can get up there and, and uh, pitch his message to very narrow constituencies because that's what we have in America. Niche marketing to very limited groups. We don't need to cross pollinate. We don't need to engage with one another. If you have your uh, right wing uh, white supremacist viewpoint, more than likely the culture is going to say whatever and just simply move on because I don't need to listen to you. I can listen to my niche market version of the truth, whether it be on the internet or the Bill O'Reilly show. I don't need to engage with the rest of the public. And so it reinforces negative narratives with the effect that we know how important these narratives are in terms of determining politics, not just in the United States, but globally. And these ideas uh, fester, they aren't opposed, and as a result, we have uh, the worst kind of balkanized politics in the United States. Um, I do believe there's a lot of hope here. Uh, Marcuse famously called for an intellectual elite to monitor the truth uh, and to basically put out uh, warnings, <laughs> black label warnings, black box warnings on ideas which you know were dangerous for all of us. Uh, but I've been encouraged by groups that really have taken it upon themselves at the level of social movement, activism, to push back, to holler back, as one movement is called, and to uh, seize the day themselves. And so I don't think we need an intellectual elite. What we do need, and what I think we do have, uh, is mobilized communities, which are very powerful in asserting their, their rights and being aggressive in terms of uh, shouting down uh, biased reactionary viewpoints. I was really encouraged by the, uh, the story that I saw from my former college where I taught. Uh, one of the professors, the esteemed professor, uh, economics, not political science, invited Charles Murray, the uh, infamous author of The Bell Curve, who basically argues for white supremacy on the basis of IQ tests. And I was very encouraged. Uh, the students, the faculty, shut it down. Uh, faculty member had to apologize and withdraw the invitation. Now, I'm sure a lot of people would complain, well, there's this political correctness for you. I think you could argue that uh, progressive politics won. And um, I, for one, am very happy to see uh, political correctness on campuses. Um, you know, I don't think we need to tolerate ideas which reinforce stereotypes or uh, negative history. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, thank you for uh, these, you know, different take on the issue of free speech. Uh, free speech. Uh, keep in mind that the, the Constitution, uh, when it comes to re these issues, really related, it stated something in the First Amendment that's um, uh, the oldest and most important one. But as my colleague um, James Roche told me over the years, this is, has been contested and has been debated uh, in every generation. And the last, the most recent case on hate speech was uh, a case, uh, Snyder vis-a-vis -vis, um, versus uh, Westboro in Kansas and the Supreme Court in 2011, uh, even though um, a man was um, hackled and, and, and uh, attacked by uh, uh, church followers um, that he used to go to, and he was burying his son, and they were saying mean things. The Supreme Court, um, eight to one, I think, vote um, decided to um, uh, not to prosecute them based on the argument of free, free speech. So this is an issue that's not going to die. This is an issue that's going to be with us forever, and, and until maybe we'll have a more utopia society. I think one day, maybe in uh, I don't know when that's going to happen. <laughs> maybe after the revolution. Maybe after life, maybe in, 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 in one day. Uh, the, um, so this is a, a, a very, very contested uh, issue, and I think uh, uh, how to resolve that thing, I don't think it's an easy one. I think we all are grappled with it. The floor now is open for comments and, and questions here, and also in our um, campus in, in Portland. 
David is, gonna, is going to um, pass the microphone to people, and I'll try to be very, very fair to... Uh, first, Chris, yeah, go ahead. There have been two incidents recently. One was a sick man was attacked and beaten, and a, there was also the much more recent one where a 14-year-old boy named Ahmed in Texas brought a t clock to school that they accused it was a bomb and they arrested him. I wanted to uh, hear your opinions based on that and what do you think how Orientalism uh, ties into this debate about PC and political correctness? I think Chris here is talking about the case this morning, if you guys watch the, the TV or the news. A kid in Texas who um, is an inventor, very bright kid, invented a, a, a clock and he took it to impress his teachers, but then he was arrested and handcuffed and um, um, uh, told it was a bomb. Uh, the whole, after they realized it wasn't, I think um, uh, Google and and um, uh, MIT, and even the president invited him to visit, um, to visit um, the White House. And now something uh, terrible turned to be something very positive. And this kid now is quite a, a celebrity. That's what Chris is talking about. Um, anybody want to talk, uh, uh, answer this question? Or should I take a, a go ahead, John. Well, I, I think that any time we talk about this, any time law and order, any, any time that law and order is invoked or you know, national security in a different context, and you know, it is used to, frequently used to go after others, and, uh, and all that that implies. If you are other in some way, you know, chances are that's going to be the justification for your uh, experience of the state. Okay. Um, I think there does seem to be a considerable uh, degree of reactivity right now. There's over-responding in so many situations instead of letting cool heads prevail, you know, assess the situation before the reaction occurs. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a question. Uh, Rob, is that Rob? Yeah. This is Rob. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I would like to defend um, the right to, to articulate hate speech and are defended with the example precisely of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has come up, said a bunch of hateful things, that guess what? A lot of people think. And rather than being some clandestine, articulated, quietly hushed, turns out, guess what? There are a ton of Republicans who are hardcore racist. And so now Republicans are debating with other Republicans and saying, oh no, you're not enough racist. You're, you know, you're an adequate amount of racist. And we're all watching it saying, these people are crazy. You know, that exposes the true, you know, what is going on there. That's number one. Number two, I would also like to uh, insist on the inadequacy of policing language. At UNE, as far as I, I've never run around somebody saying the N-word or calling me spick, none of those things. But how many people on the faculty we have that are people of color? We've done a great job of having students not use racist language, but where is the structural component of addressing racial inequality at our, in our own institution. So I think the, the policing of language both masks already what is there and needs to be addressed. You can't heal a wound without addressing that there is a wound there. And also it is inadequate. That's all I have. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, very, very provocative ideas here, that, indeed. Uh, let's uh, take a question from this side and I'll get back to you uh, there. Okay, uh, this side. You folks have to wake up and ask uh, some questions or uh, maybe make a comment. Uh, hi. I guess my question would be, what role do we have legally uh, against hate speech? I know we've talked about the Supreme Court and of uh, personal people shooting down uh, hate speech, but what role do we have legally to reprimand? Or do we have a role legally to reprimand these people? Usually the courts uh, resolve these things. We you have a litigation, and the, and the courts uh, resolve that. And there is, of course, public opinion debates and commentary. There. So there are two ways I think our society handles these things. Um, just one thing. Yeah, go ahead. One thing. Um, as an educator, I'm bound to stand up for the protected categories. So I'm legally bound to do that, not just as a human being, but also as an educator. So that's certainly a protection. But those are protected categories. There are some differences that are not um, 
legally protected. Uh, we as human beings, I think, would still you know, stand up for someone who was being attacked for their difference. Um, but that's what a teacher has to do. I'll leave if I may. <coughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just one more kind of a footnote. Um, the, uh, the dicey nature of tolerance in a democracy, I think, was recognized by the Congress. Uh, which reinforced and passed at various times uh, an entity known as the Fairness Doctrine. So if you decided that you were going to uh, get on a grandstand or a soapbox and broad stroke uh, Latinos in the United States, you would be compelled to uh, have fair time for the other side. Uh, that was removed in 1989. And I would argue that we've seen a skyrocket in broadcast hate speech with code words symbols and all the other accoutrements that go along with it. Uh, my friend Rob has much more faith in, uh, in the body politic than I do. I think instead of uh, sunshine being the best disinfectant and us having this kind of social laboratory or an educational laboratory, I think what we've actually done is mobilize and, and prey off of the deepest fears of, of the society. So I don't think it is actually uh, been educational. I don't think it's been progressive. I think it's reinforced narratives, as I said, and mobilized uh, the worst elements in people. Is there a question from the uh, our colleagues in the uh, Portland campus? There are no questions at this time. Okay. <laughs> okay, just to make sure. Thank you. Yeah, make sure that you guys are with us. Okay. Uh, I think there is a question here. Um, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, so um, you know, something that wasn't touched upon uh, here was the rationale for having the First Amendment and why we might put up with a lot of what people are deeming hate speech. So I think this is important to note that, you know, um, for a long time, like I'm thinking of the earliest historical person, David Hume, philosopher, people who you know, he defends free speech by saying it's basically a protection, it's insurance against tyranny. So it's not, you know, you can have different defenses of free speech. You can think, oh, people are going to arrive at a true view if they all talk about it. That's perhaps too optimistic, as, um, as you were pointing out. Uh, you could think it's just a right to just express whatever you want, and that's just good for you as a person. But there's a, there's a more important, I think, justification for tolerating a lot of what people here are talking about as hate speech. And it's that, you know, we don't want an oppressive regime to get a hold and and, and suppress and oppress political dissidents and things like that, which obviously countries do, like North Korea and things like that. So this right that we have, it comes with all kinds of like side effects that may be bad, but um, I think I'm very wary of a lot of the things with due regard to everybody on the panel. I highly disagree with most everything that's been said. Um, just because it's, and it's, it's, not, it's not without note that the views that, that you all express and calling these things hate speech and calling Donald Trump a racist are things that huge amounts of the country would, would disagree, sincere Americans would, would disagree, and they say, you're the ones with the hate speech. You're the ones that want to suppress their freedoms and change their country in a way that they think is grotesque, frankly. So, you know, and that's, that's also a lot of the student body. So it's just, just an example of how things can get ensconced and people can get a sense of moral righteousness and think that what they're doing is just silencing ignorance and hate when um, it's not clear that that's really what's always gonna happen. I mean, I know yeah, everybody who has certain views is convinced they're right, but the other side does too. So I, I'm wary of this kind of tyranny and uh, I just wanted to just uh, kind of note that. I think that's a very um, uh, provocative uh, comment, but uh, would you, uh, do you have any, Answer yourself. I mean, if you think you disagree with our panelists in this, so how do you deal with the with with speeches like that? Well, I mean, in terms of like, so if you think that a candidate gets up and says something that's that's racist or something like that, well, okay. I mean, so um, John Carney suggested this, the the strongest position there, which was like you know to to, sh to shut people down if possible, to use political power uh, to to stop speech, and I'm. I'm I'm, I'm very much against that, you know, so I think that um, uh, the example he mentioned, for example, is a good one. The, the author of the bell curve, uh, not, not, not Charles Murray. Yeah. Charles, Charles Murray, Murray. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Charles Surrey is a sincere man who's been working his entire life researching things in a scholarly way, and he has, you know, he has a different opinion, but I think that that should, opinion should be heard, and if we disagree with it, then, you know, we can, we can use 
arguments and evidence to, to go against it. I think we should be wary of doing that, especially on college campuses. I mean, this is the one place where we should have free inquiry about these things. And I hear, I hear, you know, these things being shut down. There's been a bunch of cases of this, and I, I, I'm, I think this is bad for our culture, and the country. So, is that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Could I say something? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I would agree that the answer is not to shut someone down, but that's why, as an educator, um, I would uh, my go-to thing is education, and not education in terms of brainwashing, but education <coughs> in terms of ex exploration and critical thinking and exploring different uh, different perspectives. Um, so that's that would be my response. That absolutely you wouldn't want something left. Don't want to do brainwashing in the opposite direction. But I think it's critical that that these kinds of issues are on the table in our courses and being addressed so that these kinds of discussions can happen. I absolutely agree that it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a new rule to not do this. But, um, and that's also why I, I'm promoting so many of the, the, like the historical background, exploring that. So understanding the disenfranchisement that has been historical happening, not just in our country, but other countries. So that we're armed with the facts so that we are not um, coming at these arguments and trying to silence the other person, but instead trying to say, okay, how do you know that to be true? My, you know, favorite, back to my favorite question, but that requires examination, exploration, research to find the answer to that. It's not a pat answer. Uh, I would argue that there are not two sides to an issue like racism. That I would want to shut people down you know, on that. But there are certainly different perspectives on so many other topics. And we, we're amongst smart people and opportunities to have these, these discussions. But it does go back to each of us taking the time to become aware historically and currently of what's going on and then have these discussions with lots of people. So I wanted to make one pitch before. Oh, I'm sorry. I, okay. Another place, in addition to the many courses that, that, and professors and all of you who are smart and bring smart um, the ideas to the table, um, you can earn a diversity leadership certificate through our Office of Multicultural Affairs. And, just, and that sort of unites a lot of the things that you're, you're hearing in courses, that you're, uh, they're all the events, that, the, so many events we have on, on the different campuses. So I encourage you to explore that option because it does give you opportunities to think and reflect and argue about a lot of these things. Okay. Clay? Yeah, just quickly, I, I think I, I um, I think it's really, really important as we talk about this, especially when we're talking about things like racism, the assumption that there are racists and there are people who aren't racist. I, I guess I want to assert racism exists somewhere deep down inside every one of us. We, are, we often unconsciously respond to stereotypes that we don't know. There's lots of research on that, but you can just see it in observation. So part of, it's very easy to categorize the other as unacceptable, um, and, but instead I think we have to look within on every one of these issues. Where does it reside in us? How do we deal with it? And only by doing that can we then really effectively deal with it in yeah, others. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right, John. Just briefly uh, to my uh, colleague over here, friend. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the argument that I was making is not that Big Brother or the state is going to enforce uh, politically correct speech. My argument is that newly liberated constituencies will take it upon themselves to represent, uh, you all have this wonderful phrase, I'm um, representing, uh, to represent uh, their truth against uh, uh, historically discredited ideas. And, and I, you know, I would just suggest that I think your perspective is ahistorical in that it equates, uh, you know, viewpoints without respect to uh, the history of that viewpoint. Uh, the stars and bars, the Confederate flag, is not a neutral flag by any means, any more than the Nazi SWAT sticker is. It has a meaning, it has a history, and that feeds into what we should and should not tolerate. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, you have Tim uh, in the back here. Yeah. I just wanted to raise the uh, suggestion that the concept of sort of thresholds is probably something worth addressing because, uh, for example, it's sort of crystal clear in our society that uh, physical assault is not to be tolerated. So there's widespread sort of agreement on that. And sort of bridging from that idea, I take it that the concept of hate speech is forwarding an argument that has to be made 
uh, that there is some forms of speech, some language acts, some speech acts, which have that sort of violence behind them or have that sort of assault of nature to them. So I think that to, to further this kind of conversation, sort of having a, a dialogue about what constitutes those thresholds would be helpful. OK, and um, let me see. Uh, yes, um, uh, I'd acknowledge you. Cynthia? I think um, Nesbitt and his colleague in Habits of the Heart really talked about the kind of two narratives in our culture which have to do with individualism and also the common good. And I think when we talk about free speech and when we talk about First Amendment, I, I go to those places of thinking about how does a society thrive with those two tensions in an existence and then how do we resolve that individually to think about what acts we make every day that um, support the common good and then also um, honor the ind individualism but uh, sort of that do no harm philosophy so I think that that our culture is thwarted with those kind of uh, juxtaposed ideas Thank you, uh, Cynthia. Yeah. Chris, do you want to have a question here? Uh, just very briefly, so we'll uh, see the others too. Yes? Uh, I think that it's important to also note other nations and how they've responded. Uh, I think a good example of this is Germany, where we all can agree they have free speech, but for example, if you are a neo-Nazi, uh, you do the Nazi salute, uh, things like that, you preach Nazi philosophy, they'll arrest you and detain you. Uh, I was wondering if you guys had an opinion, um, this goes with thresholds, uh, it, at what point should we say this is not something we can tolerate uh, when they're starting to threaten violence, for example, or they're preaching that other people should take violent action? It's a great question, Chris. Um, I, I think the the distinction I would make would be that of individual agency. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a matter of any particular individual or litmus test, uh, but this is something that comes not from the top down, but from the bottom up. So if there's something that's truly egregious and reactionary, a previously mobilized, latent perhaps, social movement will take up the heavy lifting and, and, and let us know that something that, that is afoot. And, um, and, and we'll see, as we did in Ferguson, Missouri, and, and other places. So, uh, so I have faith that instead of a top-down approach with human agency being the, the, the linchpin for, for the litmus test, it would come from the level of the social movement and praxis. Okay. Just, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just, that was a good question. I was thinking, as, again, as an educator, thinking that even though there might not be a gun involved or there might not be a knife involved, the words, back to the Wessler quote, you know, the words hurt and the words shut a student down. I mean, a student can't learn if they're scared and, if they, and they may stop coming to school. So there are word, the words create an environment where a person cannot be him or herself, too. Um, and I just wanted to briefly say the, the um, in, and I'm not a constitutional scholar, um, but, I, but I've uh, been doing some reading in preparation for this, too. And, and it's made me think, um, with our Constitution or in our country, are we, what are we protecting? Are we protecting opinion? Are we protecting fact? And I know that there can be arguments about fact, but wasn't I'll have to defer to some of the uh, other people in the room. But was it Voltaire who said that you know, you're completely entitled to your, um, your own opinion, but not your own set of facts? And I think that that's something that you, we all, you know, wrestle with. And that evidence-based thinking, that critical thinking, where we're trying to find out, you know, okay, what's behind this? What are, what is the evidence? And in my courses, I'm encouraging my students to go to fact check and so on. And then, but one of my students said, well, who's checking the fact checkers? You know, <laughs> good, question, you know? good question. And I tell them to check my facts too. You know, put the, put the lens on me too. But I think that's the tension for me. I don't. I don't, it would be hard for me to defend someone's right to have an, a, an egregious opinion that related to um, race and other categories that I think should be protected. It would, I could protect someone who wanted to express facts that were, you know, or that was, were different than mine. And then we'd both dive into the research and explore and find out, well, what is the truth? 
which of course we've been search searching for for a long time. But. Uh, thank you. Um, we have Tim and Paul. Oh, oh Paul. Paul. Yeah, yeah, I can speak from here. No, no, uh, that's in fairness to this side. I want to be very, very even and, and fair to each side. So go I, ahead. I don't think there was enough said about uh, the 16-year-old boy who built a digital clock. Yeah. It was a science project. Yeah. His name was Mohammed. Yeah. His first name. Mm -hmm. Brought him into school, showed it to his science teacher. Uh, he appreciated it, said, don't show it to other teachers. He ended up in another class with a teacher who said, that looks like a bomb. While he was there, it beeped. She took it to the office, and he was met there with law enforcement officers, and he was arrested. He was released after they understood everything. Yes. Well, that is, of course, a good outcome because the kid now is, is really getting a lot of recognition. And so maybe out of a misunderstanding, something positive came out. Uh, Tim. Uh, thank you guys for doing this. Really appreciate it. Um, so I was watching the debate last night. And you can say whatever you want about Carly. Uh, Fiorina. Thank you. I was going to mispronounce it. Yeah. Um, she was asked a question. I can't remember the exact wording of it, but it was about they were going to replace um, someone who was on one of the, the bills, the American bills, with a woman. And she resented it, saying that we don't need you guys to put us on a bill to make us feel better. And I find that a lot of times in politics, it's not just women, but it's also a lot of the racial issues. If you have a congressman or a senator who's coming from an urban area, they're going to try and push bills forward who are based on you know, a certain minority getting more, getting less, or trying to do the equality. And I think that a lot of times what happens is you get too much. And so that it is almost in an unfair way towards everybody else to, to the rest of us. So I think most of the people in this room who are in a younger generation, they didn't grow up hearing the N-word a lot, except in comedy. And so I feel like for myself a lot of times, when I associate racism, I associate with bad people. and when you associate a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now, it, it's kind of like puts in that gray area where, is it okay to laugh at a joke where the N-word is mentioned? Like, does that make me racist? And it makes us question that, and I kind of resent that. And I wonder what you guys think, and is that gonna be a political change that we see, or is that just gonna be a perpetuating cycle that we have to live with? Well, we know that uh, historically, what certain things were tolerated, and one on one time, and, and later on, because of power relations. Because this is not a question of uh, only of free speech and hate speech. We're talking about inequalities and power relations that exist in societies. And I think um, it's funny, Tim, you mentioned uh, comedy, because if I put my Jim Scott's um, perspective on this, uh, then it's a zone where we don't really debate or get angry at each other. You know, I, when, when we listen to comedy, it's a different zone. And, and people can min, make fun of uh, each other. Of, of, they see a lot of things, and we tolerate that, which is a wonderful cultural uh, form, where um, in, in that situation, as in Carnival, you know, um, people, or in, in Thanksgiving, uh, I mean, or um, uh, in, um, uh, certain cultural occasions, society takes a break. And instead of really getting at each other's throat, society can relax and accept a uh, different kind of exchange. So I, I think uh, I hear uh, your point very well, but um, uh, I think this country, the, the remarkable things, American society came a long way. But at the same time, new challenges are emerging. And how to balance that, as we said at the beginning of this uh, panel, uh, our Constitution Day, is a tough one. I think one of the areas of exploration, too, is Dr. Smith's work on the desensitization of language mm. and how that objectifies and places people in a kind of a non-person status and strips us of our humanity. So I think how we use language and the narrative we promote, either through humor, political discourse, etc., really goes a long way. And we look at Germany and we look at history to see how that ekes into a society in a way that can be very uh, 
destructive and detrimental, and we look around the globe right now. So I think there, there's a, an intersection to explore there. Yes. Yeah, just yeah, uh, yeah. Heather, want to comment too? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, what Cynthia's point I think is really important. The, it always starts with dehumanizing the other. Anything that we decide is okay to do to someone, that we dehumanize them first. And, and David Smith's work is is strong in that. Um, I think to speak to Tim's question a little bit, that um, I never presume that I know how the other person feels. Um, when a joke is told or anything is happening. It, it, and even if it were someone of my so-called tribe, I wouldn't presume that I would know his or her experience. So whatever my identifiers are, we're, we're, each of us is very unique in our experiences with hearing the language or a joke or anything else. It's really critical that we be sensitive to that because cause some of us have had less to deal with than others in this culture. We'd have more to deal with in another culture. So I think that's the thing. I never presume I know how the other person is feeling. But maybe that fosters the conversation because I want to know how you feel. You know, it's so. Uh, OK. Um, other comments or questions? Oh, OK. Go ahead. Can I ask another, make him another annoying comment? Um, uh, so, um, so yeah, I just want to push back again here about this uh, being sensitive kind of stuff. Um, I think this is really uh, like a plague on the university at this point. Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying, so I'm going to put this in somewhat provocative terms. Um, just, so, you know, the idea that we need to be sensitive about everybody's background and where they're coming from and whether what their experiences have been and what upsets them. They're traumatized. I hear this language, students are traumatized now. Um, and it's, it's become prohibitive to having, I think, honest discussions and critical discussions about a lot of issues. Um, I'm warned now by my chair, if I talk about suicide in my philosophy classes, I need to give a, a quote, trigger warning to students. Now, okay, I understand students are upset about you know, experiences, it's a, it's a disturbing topic. But you know, it's, it's a university, and this, this is especially applies to a university, not the culture at large. I mean, a university is something I'm specifically concerned with here because I think the, the quality and the openness of the dialogue is being prescribed by these kind of concerns in a way that, that concerns me, concerns me. I mean, we all come in with various baggage and emotional problems and things like that to the university, but I think the message to the students and the community should be, uh, this is an intellectual environment, and it's going to be uncomfortable to think about some of the things here in general. And you know, we're not. And this includes racial topics. You know, uh, if we're going to talk about them, we're going to talk about them honestly, without being wor worried about being labeled a racist. You know, um, this. I think this should be happening in a university. I don't think we should be worried. And there's there is worries now. I mean, you can't you can't express certain views without being labeled a racist or a sexist or an Islamophobe or or what have you. And I think that's truly a danger to the open society at the university. So I just, and, and some of this stuff, again, I'm hearing from the panel. I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not, I'm just trying to be, this is an open discussion, so I'm kind of pushing back a little bit. So uh, just a clarification, I think you, you want to have an open forum. You are advocating for this. Where do you draw the line between, um, um, between just not everybody, it, everything can have to be examined and um, at some point, as we try to um, um, discuss today, things that are hurtful, things are are um, negative, things are demeaning to others. Where are you going to draw the line for uh, you know on, on, on this issue? Well, you know, I mean, pretty pretty far. I would try to draw pretty far in this environment. I think the university should be as an intellectual environment, so that's going to require a lot of leeway in terms of what gets said. I mean, you know, I shouldn't come out and say you know your mother's ugly. Um, that's, that's, there's usually, there's probably no intellectual point, but if we want to have a discussion about, say, Muslim terrorists, and we want to say something like, you know, I think Islam has a violence problem. I think it's within their religion itself. You know, if somebody wants to express that view and back that up with evidence, which some scholars, like, for example, I'm just picking an example, um, you know, that's something that should get a hearing, and people shouldn't be worried, like, oh, are there Muslim students in the class who are going to be offended? Well, if they are, you know, that's tough. That's, that's what the academic environment should be. We want to talk about racial issues. You want to talk about do is there is there issues in American black culture where there's you know prone to violence or whatever whatever you want to talk about criticisms negative things that people might say well you're being a ra are you being a racist and I would say no no you know, we have to talk about this honestly in academia and, and I'm I'm worried that that's going away I mean I know it's going away 
I think your point very well taken. Yeah. But there is, there is still, uh, we have to recognize they are racist. Uh, society. Well, I mean, even there, the, the very contention that things are racist, like Nancy said, well, that, you know, I, I can't tolerate racism. Well, there's going to be a lot of disagreement about what amounts to racism. But, but you don't recognize that. Not from black people, though. What's that? I said, uh, not from black people. This is really bringing up the issue of. Who gets to decide what's, right. thing, what's racist? I don't think white people. Who gets to decide? I mean, there, well, there's a, there's a truth people, about some of these No, there's things. no objective truth. There's people who have experienced the okay, effects okay, of it's racism. Really, it's really, really important in this conversation to talk about privilege. It's a, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. It, it greatly depends on perspective. We often, when we talk about racism, we don't acknowledge privilege. And, you know, just as an example, I, as a white person, a white male, I don't need, particularly white male, I don't need to know as much about women's experience as they need to know about the male experience to survive. Likewise, as a white person, I don't need to know as much about minority culture or a black person's life as they need to know about me to survive and make their way in this the society. So I, I think w if we're going to have that conversation, we have to, um, especially when you have a largely white group, it's really, really important to spend some time on that subject as well. And that, and that, that gets us into three more hours. I have to say, I have to apologize because I have to be at a meeting. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll <laughs> <laughs> no, have to be in okay, uh, some of you have to go to classes, I understand that. We're going to very briefly, um, uh, Heather? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, just, again, thank you all for coming. I wanted to say that, that not in, in opposition to the gentleman I was talking about there, but I think that what we need are forums, you know, classrooms. I talk to my future teachers in those classes and say, your classroom may be the only place that a student gets to examine particular issues, but there's a way to examine them in an evidence-based way, in a critical thinking way, looking at perspectives in a respectful way. Um, the fact that we we are not in an ultra-diverse environment doesn't mean that we're not going to be in one tomorrow or you're not going to be in one for your future professions. Um, or be, and a lot of our differences are under our skins, you know, so we have to be very sensitive to that. But I think that practicing in our classrooms, hopefully with, you know, learning how to respectfully examine these issues is critical, and um, that's what I like to do in my classes, and I certainly appreciate the students who engage in them. So. Oh, there's a question in the Portland campus. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, folks, before we go, I want to thank all of you yeah, for attending. This has been lively um, conversation. And there are copies, copies of the uh, Constitution. Please come and pick up a copy of the U.S. Constitution. How is it leads to the very lively Perfect. Yeah, Okay, you're all set? Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey there, how are you? You're welcome. Take some coffee with you. Yeah, take more than one. If you want to take one, send me a Thank you. Thank you. Hey there. Uh, see you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good. You're the value. It was wonderful. So where's the Oh, wow. Oh, you do? Where do you live? Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Good luck. That's the best Thank you. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah. Q&A. I really was. I think it's really good. 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 I think it's really good